Hi, my name is Tracy Tagama Espinosa, and this is a video on physical activity and how it influences learning and optimal performance. So the big question is, what is physical activity? Do I have to like go out to the gym, which like, by the way, didn't exist 30 years ago, or does weeding, watering my garden count as physical activity? Pretty much everything counts as physical activity. And being sedentary is actually new to humanity. We've never had this problem before, but we, for the first time in humanity, we are seeing problems here with obesity because of sedentary behavior. There are wonderful studies now by the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that make Clear recommendations. You can take a quick uh, little quiz there to sort of determine your own physical activity level and to see what is your optimal weight and what are types of things that could fit into your lifestyle that would help you get enough physical activity. So when asked and when rated by the Center for Disease Control, they said, okay, is, you know, doing light gardening, well, what's the equivalent of that? Uh, doing downhill skiing or doing a bunch of calisthenics and, and push-ups or playing uh, racquetball. They basically measuring the energy that's expelled doing those different activities. And they recommend, you know, uh, an average adult needs two hours and 30 minutes or about 150 minutes of moderate uh, intensity aerobic exercise, like brisk walking every week. But they should combine this with some muscle strengthening, uh, maybe two days a week, right? Or they could do only an hour and 15 minutes of vigorous intense activity. So they've given you a lot of either ors here, basically to try to see what fits your lifestyle. But the whole idea is that everybody should have some level of physical activity. One of the reasons we're studying how the physical body impacts the mind is related to things like neurotransmitters and physical exercise. We know that exercise increases things like norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and GABA receptors in the brain. So this is kind of interesting because all of these things lend themselves to synaptic activity and neuroplasticity. So when we ask the question then, how does physical activity improve cognitive function? It's through the release of these chemicals. But on top of that, there's evidence that brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which is related to nerve growth and to neurogenesis, which is important for long-term memory, is expelled also during physical activity. So bottom line answer, release of certain chemicals, but most especially uh, BDNF, which is released during physical exercise, which is shown to improve cognitive function. So now let's watch Dr. Thompson's video related to neuroconnections and physical exercise in the National Institute of Health's take on the vision of physical exercise and its role in cognitive functions. Exercise is interesting in terms of effects on the brain because it, it, it works in about four or five different ways. Uh, one of the most obvious ways is blood flow. And so if you uh, get your heart working, your brain's going to be filled with um, oxygen-rich blood and nutrients. So that's the main way that, that we thought it helps. The other way that's sort of interesting uh, is it's been thought that exercise produces uh, new neurons. And so exercise induces the production of growth factors, one, one's called BDNF and it actually stimulates the production of new brain cells. Now, when I was in school 20 years ago, we were told you can't get any new brain cells. So when you're born, that's your lot. You know, you're not gonna make any more. But more recently, we found that uh, exercise is a really good way of, of stimulating brain cell production. And some of these are functional. And so um, just this notion that something that you can do can generate new brain cells is, is a really great uh, th th thing to think about. So we, we were wondering why exercise helps the brain. And what one theory is it just reduces stress. So maybe it's not that uh, your blood is coming to the brain, maybe you're less stressed and then, you know, and that, that was something that imaging allowed us to test. And so we scanned a whole lot of people with high cortisol levels. And so if you're stressed, if you're, you're angry about something, or even if you're stuck in traffic, your cortisol levels can be very high. But one of the things we found is that the people with high uh, cortisol levels lost brain tissue faster. Well, that's a serious problem. So as soon as you know that's true, you can look at ways of reducing your cortisol. And so that's a very easy thing to do. I mean, we, we can get less stressed by um, exercising, walking, taking breaks. And so imaging established a physical connection between something in your blood, like the cortisol that's a sign of stress, and actual physical changes in the brain. That's very useful to know. Take care of your brain. And, and uh, there's a lot of ways we know that you can take care of your brain. You can eat a good diet, uh, you can exercise. You can reduce stress. Um, you can make sure you're well educated. And these things just build up a sort of mental bank account for the future. And so e even though it seems like uh, you know, work is hard, I mean, you're building a store of brain connections that you'll need for the rest of your life. So these are practical messages that we've learned from imaging a lot of people. So. so remember, we talked about the different ways that you could have physical exercise. Well, here's 
the big question, what would be the best exercise then? Should you do aerobic exercise or should you do prolonged exercise? Short-term or prolonged aerobic exercise, which is still being researched. All studies show some gain when you do some kinds of exercises. But the big question is, are kids, for example, in American high schools, are they getting enough physical exercise if they just go out you know, once a week for a jog? Or is it better that they would have exercise every single day? Or is it even better if they have less frequent exercise, but they have more intense exercise? All of that is still up for debate. What we do know, which is kind of interesting, is that higher fit children have larger brain volumes, but actually they also have larger bodies. So if they're having larger bodies, your brain and your body are proportionate. So it could very well be based on that. But Chad Hyman and colleagues uh, would like to push this idea that higher fit children also show superior brain functioning, not just size. So physical activity is important for, for cognition and for learning as a whole. Another big area of continued research related to physical activity and brain activity has to do with cell biology, uh, immunology, and, and the role of exercise in increasing the body's ability to fight off disease. We know it goes in both directions, right? When you're ill, you can't learn. And when you exercise well, then your immune system can be boosted. And then we get back to this general saying, you know, so sound mind, sound body. We also know that there's a lot of very interesting research going on related to cognitive decline. People are growing older and living a lot longer than they used to. And we've not paid enough attention to what they need to keep their minds going. We know that good physical exercise is a good protective factor. We know that a certain level of exercise serves to stave off the natural cognitive decline of dementia, Alzheimer's, and other neurodegenerative diseases. And the mechanisms by which this occurs are still being studied, though there's no doubt it's a protective factor in aging against cognitive decline. Okay, so exercise is great throughout the lifespan. So we come back always to this big idea of risk and protective factors. What are the risk and protective factors that we have in our life for doing enough physical activity? I hope you come with a lot of great questions about physical activity and exactly what that means in your own life. What are the risk and protective factors that you might be faced with? And how does this influence your mind's ability to learn by taking care of your body? Looking forward to talking to you soon.